Good morning. This morning, uh, I'm going to start, since we're focusing on the Psalms, uh, Pastor Diane rather succinctly kind of summarized a lot of what the Psalms are about. Uh, but I'm going to start with uh, a reading from the Psalms, Psalm 42, 1 through 3, that I think uh, sort of encapsulates the Psalms quite well, too. It was written by the sons of Korah. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, whilst men say to me all day long, where is your God? Well, in choosing today's method, message, uh, I struggled a lot, like Pastor Diane suggests sometimes, in terms of how to title this. Uh, I considered the prayer book of the Bible, uh, in the heart of the Bible, in the middle of it all. Uh, while each would have been a good choice, I simply went with the Psalms in the end. Today we'll be doing kind of an overview of a very significant book within the Bible called the Psalms. Uh, and this is a little bit unique today. Uh, rather than building a sermon on an individual psalm uh, or passages within them, which certainly could be done many times over, uh, I'm going to attempt to look at the, the entirety of the book. And part of this is driven, uh, I think, and it's appropriate today with uh, this being kind of the teacher recognition day, uh, giving a Bible out. Um, so it's appropriate. Uh, and also, recently we conducted an all-church survey, and teaching scripture and Bible knowledge were two things that rated very highly. So the Spirit moved me then to uh, take this approach today. Uh, the scriptures we'll be looking at uh, were written over the course of a thousand years. So obviously we're not going to cover every detail of, of that material. Uh, I personally became more aware of the Psalms and the importance of them a couple of years ago when my small group did a study uh, on the Psalms. So today we're going to have sort of a Cliff Notes version uh, on the Psalms. Uh, and I, I guess I would encourage you after today to, if you have time, to look more closely into the book of Psalms. My group studied a short-term disciple Bible study uh, from Abington Press uh, called Invitation to Psalms. It contains 10 different segments in it. It has a DVD uh, that you can watch, uh, and in the DVD they have readings of the Psalms followed by uh, some theologians that uh, uh, give their insight into what was read and into the Psalms. And then there's also a workbook that accompanies it that lets you uh, actually read through the entire book of Psalms uh, with some guidance. Uh, this material will be in our church library and available for either you in a small group or you individually to, to turn to. Uh, as we go forward, uh, you might even be uh, inclined to grab a pew Bible. Uh, and there are notepads in the pews that you could take notes if anything strikes you. Uh, the Psalms are pretty easy to find. Uh, they're literally located right in the, the middle of the Bible. Uh, I uh, looked at the pages in the Old Testament. There's 890 pages there, 261 in the New Testament. That makes a total of 1,151 pages. And uh, the half of that is 575 and a half, which puts you right in the middle of the Bible, which is the Psalms, Psalm 135. Uh, so could there be a reason why the Psalms are located right there in the middle? Um, and to begin with, I guess, why is it important for us to turn to the Bible anyway? Perhaps the answer lies in Psalm 119. How can I keep my way pure? By living according to your word. 
I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. If you look at this psalm, uh, you'll see that we read a very short portion of it. Psalm 119 is not only the longest psalm, but is the longest chapter in the entire Bible. It contains 176 verses, all dedicated to the importance of following God's word. While our pew Bible displays it, displays it verse after verse, the original text broke it out into an ordered grouping of verses which followed the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, this was done as an aid in committing these verses to memory. The verses we heard were the second set referred to as Beth, which is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Oftentimes, the more written space, I think, that's allocated to a subject, uh, it relates to the importance of that. So certainly, I would suggest that this is saying it's important to turn to Scripture. It's the longest set of verses in the entire Bible. So as we begin to look at the Psalms, you might ask, why are they so important? Some interesting things strike me. As mentioned earlier, they're literally in the middle of the Bible. They're very accessible. Since each one stands alone, you can easily read one at a time, and you can also take piece, bits and pieces of them and weave them together. And often uh, throughout uh, worship, that, that has been done. Uh, the Psalms, not only 119 contains more verses, but the Psalms in themselves contain more verses than any other book within the Bible. It's almost as if they want to be found. The lectionary usually, always actually, includes a psalm as an optional reading. We probably hear a psalm as the first Bible reading more frequently than any other book of the Bible. Our hymnal contains numerous psalms put to music for use in worship. The Episcopal Church has placed the Psalms into an individually bound book called the Common Book of Prayer, and in total there are 150 Psalms. The Psalms were written between the time of Moses and the Babylonian captivity, a period of about a thousand years. Moses is known to have written the very first and oldest Psalm. In it, Moses contrasts the mortality and fragility of humankind to the internal and eternal and all-knowing nature of God. He lays out how short our earthly time is and stresses how we must use the work of our hands wisely in line of God's direction during the time we have here. Despite the troubles we face in life, he points out that we must ultimately trust in God with our eternal home in mind. So I'll read Psalm 90, uh, and this was written, as near as I can determine, about to 34 to 3,600 years ago, but it holds true today. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, you brought forth the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new. By evening it is dry and withered. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. The length of our days are 70 years or 80 if we have strength, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow. For they quickly pass and we fly away. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Have compassion on your servants. 
May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. While wrote, Moses wrote this one psalm, there are at least seven other writers of the psalms, but David uh, is most associated with the psalms as he wrote almost half of them, uh, and totaling about 73 that we know of. Uh, the, about 50 or so psalms are unascribed, yet some people feel that David wrote some of those as well. While the, the psalms appear as one book, they're actually composed of five books which mimic the five books of Moses, those books being Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Psalms is one of two books from the Old Testament most frequently quoted in the New Testament. The other contender would be Isaiah. Jesus himself frequently quoted the Psalms. He often addressed his father using a psalm. While the Psalms are generally considered poetry, as Diane mentioned, they are done in a different style than most poetry of today. They are also very rich in image imagery, thus we are wrapping some projected Im images into the service today. The Psalms have been categorized in many different ways by those who have studied them intensely. Some categories would include shared community prayer, individual prayer, lament and petition, praise and thanksgiving, trust, and him, among others. There are several psalms that are in each of those categories within the book. The psalms have served as inspiration in many ways and in many forms. There is even a revival of this within contemporary music and art. Martin Luther said that the entire Bible, quote unquote, is contained in the psalms. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, a German minister executed by the Nazis near the, near the end of World War II, referred to the Psalms as the prayer book of the Bible. Perhaps John Calvin uh, made the most stunning comments. He called the, the Psalms an anatomy of the parts of the soul. He goes on to say there is no emotion of which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented as a mirror. The Spirit of God brings life to these pages. All the griefs, sorrows, fears, doubts, hopes, cares, and perplexities with which our minds are likely to be consumed. Calvin also says that the genuine and earnest prayer proceeds from a sense of our need and next from faith in the promises of God. The Psalms are like a blueprint or a roadmap from God in prayer. One commenter, commenter I ran across stated that to truly love and be loved, we must engage in totally honest conversations. John Wesley also wrote extensively about the Psalms. In today's world, we have often learned to be very at the surface uh, in our conversations. The Psalms are certainly very different than this. They allow us to enter the inner room and peek behind the closed door at true and honest prayer. In this way, we are given a doorway to connect to ourselves and to God, from the peaks of joy and praise to the depths of personal and community despair. So let's begin our look at a few of the Psalms. Since we have a limited amount of time, many of the readings here that we'll hear are very condensed or slightly amended, thus you may wish to read them uh, in full later. So note, most of the readings are coming from the, the New International Version of the Bible. Uh, one category of psalm that was referred to is praise and thanksgiving. Psalm 19 and 145 are good examples of this. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world.
Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful in his pur promises and loving toward all he has made. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. I hesitated to condense Psalm 145. Uh, among Jews, it is known as the Ashrei. It is an acrostic psalm, meaning its verses are laid out in an alphabetic order, again to uh, aid in memory. Uh, it is so highly regarded that it is repeated three times per day during the full course of Jewish prayer. It is felt that if it is thoughtfully recited, it actually moves God and can assure a passage into heaven. Next, we'll hear Psalm 51, immediately followed by 32. Psalm 51 is penitential. It is a confession of sin, a plea for mercy, and an offer of repentance. It was written by David under, after his adultery with Bathsheba. Psalm 30, as Psalm 32 is read, in response to 51, look to the relief which is received when we ask God to forgive our sins. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For you know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave me and the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with the songs of deliverance. The Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Some psalms are harder for us to look at and are often avoided. However, we should understand that these psalms still connect us with our human experience and our yearning for justice to be done. They show us that we can bring our true feelings to God regardless of the sentiment. These are the imprecatory psalms, which essentially seek a curse to be placed by God on someone or something. Pastor James Adams has this to say about imprecatory psalms. We must be candid enough to acknowledge that to pray for the extension of God's kingdom is to solicit the destruction of other kingdoms. When we pray as Jesus taught us, we cry out to God for blessings upon his church and for his curses upon the kingdom of the evil one. I have the word nasty written in my Bible next to this next 
brief passage. As Bruce reads from Psalm 109, try substituting words like the evil one, cancer, war, poverty, even personal things you dislike about yourself, or any other unjust thing which concerns you in place of the enemy to which David is referring within this psalm. O oh God, whom I praise, do not remain silent. When the wicked one is tried, let him be found guilty. May his days be few. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children be wandering beggars. May they be driven from their ruined homes. May strangers plunder the fruit of his labor. May no one extend kindness to him or take pity on his fatherless children. May his descendants be cut off, their names blotted out from the next generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. May the sin of his mother never be blotted out. May their sins always remain before the Lord, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. Perhaps the most important psalm of lament is Psalm 22. It was written by David hundreds of years before Jesus. There are several psalms which are believed to refer to the promised Messiah. See if you hear Jesus while hanging on the cross, carrying the burden of our sin. Perhaps it's no uh, coincidence that Psalm 23 immediately follows us. It may be the most familiar of our psalms uh, as it's uh, most frequently heard at funerals, but it's a comfort at any time, and it's considered in the category of a song of trust. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for, before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all of my, t all of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. So what is my take on the Psalms? The Psalms are us. The sentiments expressed are eternal to the human condition. They are us as we live in the here and now between what is past and that which is yet to be. While we may need to modify some of the Psalms to fit our individual life circumstance, they are a blueprint from God for doing so. Others remain eternal with no modification needed. They are a gift. They are our souls as we work to reconcile what we see and experience in this life with our striving for relationship to God. They are words given to us by God to help us be honest not only with our personal connection to our soul, but to him as well. The Psalms are words from God telling us that he understands us. He hears us. And much like a psychotherapist, he is echoing back to us what he knows we feel. He wants us to bring ourselves to him as we are. Our God wants us to be in an honest and loving relationship with him. Within the Psalms, he provides those directions like the voice of a GPS as it directs us to our destination. So read the Psalms, pray the Psalms, know that the Psalms are there for you. Amen.